Hello everyone, my name is Bradley and this is SumSub, a channel on how to survive in the online jungle. Now, do you know what this is? Well, you should do. It's a floppy disk, an analogue of modern flash drives and SD cards. And it also comes from the 90s. Now, one and a half megabytes of information fit on it. Now, it could be used to store documents or transfer programs, and even operating systems were sold using them. For example, Doom 2 occupied five different floppy disks, and Windows 3.11 occupied as many as eight. But why am I bringing up such an artifact now? Well, it's quite interesting, but every second we spend on the internet, we generate data the size of such a floppy disk. Photos, music, posts, memes, video streams. If you saved all of that on floppy disks, you'd need a stack of 70 meters high per day. Every day, together, we generate 2.5 quintillion bytes of new information. That's a lot. And today, I'm actually gonna tell you how to protect the most important part of all of this information. It's as expensive as gold, as necessary as oil, and as explosive as gunpowder. So let's look at the main upcoming trend of 2022, privacy enhancing computing. <laughs> Nearly 80% of Americans are actually concerned about how companies are using their personal data. More than half of users often refuse to use specific services or software due to concerns about the confidentiality of their personal information. Now, ordinary people are thinking about protecting their personal correspondence. I'm not talking about hackers or cyber criminals, but journalists, engineers, and teachers. They're leaving WhatsApp and creating accounts in Signal or Telegram so that their messages aren't found uh, in the work screens of Facebook moderators. Equally, to protect themselves from the all-seeing eye of contextual advertising, ordinary users are abandoning Safari and Google and instead are using Brave and DuckDuckGo. They're not using public Wi-Fi networks, but rather have mastered VPN and Tor technologies instead. It's a real revolution. But not only users are afraid for their personal data. For many companies, working with such information also creates a lot of problems. They simply don't have the opportunity to create their own personal data processing system. So, well, they have to turn to other companies for help. And then everything gets bad. Very bad. As an example, in recent years, 56% of companies that have used the services of third-party personal data operators have encountered their unfair use. But what do I mean by that? Well, in 42% of those cases, the data was simply stolen by intruders. Nice opinion. One small issue. I am inside your home. Because of that, it's not surprising that there are more and more startups in Silicon Valley aimed at protecting your personal data. According to Crunchbase, investments in them have already exceeded $3 billion. Those investments are growing day by day. In addition to the security of working with data, there's another problem here, information duplication. Now, social networks, payment systems, car rental services, insurance companies, government authorities, I mean, these all require you to enter the same data, right? Your phone number, your surname, first name, driver's license, bank cards maybe, and we repeatedly enter this data in different applications and on different websites. And we also spend a lot of time on two-factor authentication. We copy codes from uh, SMSs, we take QR code photos or follow temporary links, and I'm fed up with all of this. And fortunately, I'm not the only one here. More and more IT companies are beginning to invest their resources into the development of something called PEC. So, PEC, Privacy Enhancing Computing, it's a new approach to working with personal information. It basically addresses the issues of confidential data processing and also its analysis. And this includes everything that does not concern the direct storage and copying of protected information. But what does this all mean in practice? Well, let's take a look. If you often pay for online purchases with bank cards, then you probably remember your security codes off by heart. MasterCard has these codes called CVC2. Visa has CVV2, but the essence is basically the same. These are the three numbers that are finally written on the back of your card. Knowing this code basically confirms that you're the card holder. So the card validation code contains only three digits, but this means that there are only 999 different codes, or maybe less. 
I've never seen a code that consists of only zeros, repeated digits, or three consecutive digits, for example, one, two, three. But on the other hand, I've only had about a dozen cards in my entire life. And it would be too rash to draw any conclusions from such a small sample. Therefore, in order to test the hypothesis about the non-random principle of the formation of codes, I'm going to ask you for your help. Please write your CVV or CVC code in the comments below this video. I'm going to collect the statistics and the probability of meeting a beautiful code. Or better yet, even send a photo of the back of your card to my email address. Stop, stop, stop. Of course I'm joking. Security codes as well as PIN codes or passwords from banking applications, these things can never be published in plain text anywhere. Okay, I hope I won't be seeing these three digit codes in the comments, but we'll see. Otherwise you might be left with no money in your account. So is it possible to test this hypothesis, but at the same time, not disclose any confidential information? Yes. Remember in the video about cryptocurrencies, I mentioned hash functions. These are complex mathematical transformations that allow you to turn your secret data into a string of letters and numbers. And moreover, this resulting string can be openly published. It's almost impossible to calculate the original value. And if you had this string of your CVV code, you could put it in the YouTube description. Look, I'm going to actually enter three digits of a random CVV code into the online hash generator. Now 049 will turn into this set of characters. See, if I use the same function for code 048 or 050, the results will be completely different. And if I tell you that the hash code from my card looks like this, the only way you'd be able to find out my real number is by calculating all possible variants of the hash function for every single number between zero and 999. Good luck with that. Now, if I were to compare a couple of thousand hashes from real CVV codes, I can actually do a statistical analysis on those hashes. If I find that the hashes are repeated more often than probability theory would allow, then I'll actually understand the codes are not created randomly. And I'll also be able to count how many lucky people have the code on their card that matches mine. Of course, the algorithms that are used in real privacy enhancing computing systems are much more complicated, but the principle really remains the same. Different systems can share data for the joint processing of data, and at the same time, they don't have to disclose them. This algorithm is called secure multi-party computing. Today, it's used in areas related to the processing of sensitive data, and this is far from the only PC algorithm. Do you remember in one of the previous videos I talked about zero-knowledge proofs? Well, this is another way to basically implement the principles of privacy-enhancing computing. And on a side note, if you're interested in this topic, let us know in the comments, because we can do some new videos where we'll talk about three more basic PC methods. There's private set intersection, we can talk about private information retrieval, and also fully homomorphic encryption. In real life, privacy-enhancing computing technologies are already being used in several areas at once. And perhaps the most high-profile case is the Boston study on the wage gap between men and women. Now, usually, such studies require real data on wages in different companies. And of course, these companies are in no hurry to publish such information. Open data, well, can become a reason for lawsuits about, say, wage inequality. And also, it's easier for competitors to headhunt if they know how much employees are getting at their current place of work. Moreover, the researchers didn't want to use the services of intermediary companies that would guarantee the confidentiality of data. This for a few reasons. First of all, it would undoubtedly lead to additional costs. And secondly, any additional intermediary increases the likelihood of, say, a leakage of sensitive information. Now, as uh, Bestavros, director of the Institute for Computing and Computational Science and Engineering, suggested another solution to this. He developed a software that basically used randomly selected large numbers to mask real data from outside observers. Without disclosing specific data for each of the 60 companies, Bestavros proved that white women earn only 83 cents for every dollar that men earn. What did you just say? Now, for women of color, the statistics were even worse. The results of the study provided the impetus for the launch of a special program run by the mayor of Boston to combat this injustice. So as we can see, this algorithm behind protected data has already helped tens of thousands of people to improve their living conditions. Now, such privacy-enhancing computing methods allow for complex research that actually conventional depersonalization algorithms do not work for. And this is especially important in the field of evidence-based medicine. 
case histories of patients from all over the world can be processed without the risk of disclosure of personal sensitive data. Now you understand how important this opportunity is in a world choking with conflict information regarding COVID-19. PEC also helps to effectively solve another problem, not to identify general trends in the data, but to find anomalies. And this helps to build an effective system to counter network fraud. Now, increasingly, they're being used to identify fraudsters in the financial insurance markets. Criminals usually try to pull off scams with several companies that are working in the same industry at once. And the problem is here, each company has to try and figure out the scammers on their own. And it takes a lot of time and effort to do so. Therefore, serious players are forced to become clients of companies that solve the problems of verifying user documents with their own methods. For example, such companies might detect fakes in a scanned document, they might compare faces with the faces in, say, a driving license, and I've already tested such systems for durability. So if you're the owner of a crypto exchange or a yacht rental company, watch that video. Now, these systems work pretty well, but the problem is that even if one company in the market is able to identify a fraudster, the rest, well, they won't know about that fraudster. And legislation severely restricts the maintenance of, say, blacklists, which would include the data of unreliable users. But with the help of privacy-enhancing computing, companies are able to safely cooperate with each other. For example, they can create a list of reliable digital identities without exchanging the personal data of the users. It's great. And imagine, for example, that by contacting a new car sharing company, you no longer have to fill out all those endless forms and wait for the results of document verification. Your trustworthiness will effectively be vouched for and confirmed by other market participants. And all at the same time, your personal information cannot get leaked to the black market. It's tempting, isn't it? Privacy-enhancing computing is a whole set of cryptographic technologies, and they basically help to solve the problems of secure storage and use of confidential data. PC enables different systems to work together with your personal information without the exchange of open data. Switching to such technologies can actually help businesses to find new customers. A huge number of people still don't trust existing means of data protection. And actually, about 27% of users never enter their real personal data when registering on a website or, let's say, on an application, if it's possible not to do so. On the other hand, scandals related to, say, high-profile leaks of personal data are forcing government agencies of different states to adopt more and more new laws on confidentiality and information protection. And it's especially difficult for companies that operate in several countries at once. For them, the anonymity and security of privacy-enhancing computing becomes a real way to resist the pitfalls of local legislation. Therefore, I share in the opinion of Gartner experts who promise that by 2025, 60% of all large organizations will implement PEC methods in their verification systems. Well, we'll know soon enough. Anyway, I'd like to thank you for joining me on another privacy-enhancing entropic escapade around the evanescent enclaves of Minecraft's end. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for joining us.